Why am I talking again about spike protein and the impact it can have on health? That's been my focus for a long time. And I'm just now in preparation for a very important webinar on a spike detox. Does everyone need one? If you are watching now and you haven't registered, please click on the link in the description and join me as I try and go through this process. This is a really important question. And as I prepare the slides and, and the thoughts and do the research around it, I'm becoming clearer in my mind as to the relevance of this. The first part of the question is, does everyone need a spike? Does anyone need a spike, spike detox? Well, it suggests that that is relevant to some people. Is it relevant to everyone? Not so clear. But I tell you what, I am starting to believe that the lucky people are the ones who have chronic symptoms related to spike protein. And the reason why I say that is because even though they're suffering with long COVID, at least they know that they are sick. What about all the people who may be struggling with similar situations, circulating spike protein, ongoing inflammation, and they don't know? It's just like hypertension, silent killer. And this is what I'm now reflecting on this concept with regards to the spike protein and how it impacts on our health. So I'm going to show you a few slides just to give you a taste as to what's coming up in the webinar. The first thing you have to note is that this is a picture of a large artery. It could be a small arteriole as well, but this is the inner lining, the endothelium. That's what I want you to con concentrate on. And then just outside it, they have this elastic layer, then a muscle layer, then another elastic layer, then a tissue layer that has all the blood vessels and so on. But what you have to remember is that inside a blood vessel, it's normally perfectly smooth. It's like glass. Even the slightest chink in it will cause it to start making clots to try and smoothen it out. It's a very important piece of the puzzle because this is what the blood will be aiming to do is to keep the endothelial surface very, very well um, smooth. Now, as people get older and there is damage to the lining of the endothelium, they can end up with plaques. OK, and these are arterial plaques and it's called uh, atherosclerosis. And this is kind of what it looks like. And you can remember this endothelial lining here. It's very smooth. And then you have some damage and you have a dep deposition of a fatty plaque under here. And this is usually where the cholesterol comes in. It's pulling in these monocytes. And this is what you have to remember. So in effect, these plaques are very often inflammatory. And when they stabilize, it's because the inflammation has, stabled, uh, has, has stabilized. But if inflammation continues, these plaques will grow. That's the critical thing that I want you to grasp in the first phase of this. One, when I do the webinar, I'll be able to give you some more details, but I'm just touching on this. But one of the things I've been focused on for a while with the COVID storm and the inflammatory process around COVID is that macrophages, this is a specific type of immune cells, are overactivated because a number of other cells that keep them in check are dysregulated by the COVID infection. And so the overactivity of these macrophages specifically will have an impact on plaque disease, atherosclerosis. And um, I'm going to have to go back a little bit because I've jumped forward in that um, presentation. But this here is what I am expecting is happening when people are having recurring infections. They have viral sepsis or a viremia. And that's now the virus circulating in the bloodstream, and then it infects these endothelial cells, then causes them to produce more um, infection and so on, 
and then it can damage the whole process, this lining. And then once that happens, there's a break in the lining. It forms a small clot. And then that's the nidus for plaque deposits. And so this is an important part of the process. And it would look something like this here, where this is the endothelial lining. Because of the inflammation, you have all these inflammatory cells going in. Low-density lipoproteins get caught up inside the macrophages. And then you have the nidus of this plaque that's in the artery. And this is what oftentimes can lead to vascular diseases. And this is what I call the silent inflammation, because very often people can have quite significant vascular involvement without any symptoms until a major event happens. And that's the chronic immune activation that I say, the COVID storm iceberg, where they may only have mild initial symptoms, but there is chronic immune activation, which drives some of the, um, the, in terms of the blood vessels, that's what would lead to heart attacks and stroke and hypertension, depending on where is affected would determine some of the other symptoms like chronic fatigue and brain fog. But very often, the heart attack doesn't cause any symptoms. The stroke doesn't cause any symptoms until it happens. Our challenge in medicine is how to identify people who are at risk and mitigate the risk. That's, that's essentially what a lot of medicine is around, is you don't just wait for the thing to happen, you try and identify it. So if the person is hypertensive, you try and get them to adjust the salt in the diet, they monitor their blood pressure, they go on medication, you try and keep the blood pressure in check. If they have had a history of heart problems, you try and put them on medication to reduce it. Everything is about mitigation and looking ahead for preventative strategies. So when it comes to this silent bit with the spike protein, this is the bit that I'm focused on. It's important to know that this is not a new thing. My research is, however, suggestive that this process is accelerated. And so this is what it would look like. When we talk about atherosclerosis, this here is a normal blood vessel. And then if you imagine they had a little bit of damage, they have this little fatty streak. Then it becomes an intermediate lesion. Then it becomes a fibrous plaque. That's when fiber, um, um, fibrous tissue is added in, and it's it's much more uh, it's much harder at this point. Uh, if you were to peel it off, you could almost peel it off. This is what the vascular surgeons do. And then it becomes a fibrous plaque type B, and now it has a fissure in it, and it pieces the extra bits around. This is when it's starting to become far more serious because it is more at risk as because of the high blood flow that if any of this should break off, one, it could cause something like a mini stroke or a stroke, or it could block the blood vessel here, rupturing, blocking the blood vessel, and that's what could lead to a heart attack or a stroke. And this is the progression. So effectively, what I am looking at is I am anticipating that this process is accelerating. So if someone had risk factors and they were about here, instead of this being 10 years, say, to go to here, it may now be three to four. That's just a presumption. But it's to emphasize the point that this is silent until something happens. Our challenge is how do we address these issues? And now some people may say that this is just um, fear mongering. Well, um, as you have to imagine, risk mitigation is about fear mongering. If you don't have some degree of concern of a future event, you wouldn't put in a fire extinguisher because you'd say it's fear mongering that you're going to have a fire. No, it's risk mitigation. It's understanding risks and trying to see if we can put things in place to mitigate them. So when we had this discussion recently um, with um, with uh, Regina Wattel, she had done a very detailed breakdown of the Norwegian data and the database. And there are two images in this that I wanted to show. One of them was what was happening in terms of the cumulative excess deaths. Normally the excess deaths should be floating around here, but they are noticing in Norway that this is rising significantly beyond what we are seeing with COVID. So there is something going on to cause people to die.
but it's not very clear. And so many people are talking about how many people they know who've had some kind of heart problem or something along the way. And the question that we have to try and figure out is, is this real and what exactly is happening? When you look at cumulative excess mortality by cause of death, same in Norway, and this is going from 2020 to 2022, one of the ones here to focus on is the cardiovascular. And you can see that it was quite low down here, but this has massively increased. And when they looked at it, the breakdown in terms of month, um, quarter by quarter, there's a huge increase cumulatively of cardiovascular disease in Norway. And you have to remember that Norway is one of those countries where they have, they're, they're generally very healthy. They, um, they, I, I think they do use saunas quite a bit. I can't remember if it's as much as Finland. They have a very high diet with fish, so good fish oils. So these are generally quite healthy people. And if they are impacted in that way, and we don't know specifically if it's related to the spike protein, but that is the presumption at the moment, even though they keep telling us that um, correlation doesn't mean causation. But um, for the time being, that's been the focus that I am looking at. How do we determine the silent ones? That's essentially what I'm trying to figure out. As I said, if you've come in late, we're talking about spike detox. Does everyone need one? And I am trying to analyze one. Does anyone even need one in the first place? But it is getting a lot of attention because a lot of people are unwell. And critically, the research is suggesting that spike protein can circulate for very long periods of time. When it circulates, is it benign or does it cause disease? If it causes disease, does it contribute to things like vascular disease and the progression of vascular disease? Those are the questions that I'm going to be trying to see if I can make head or tail of in this presentation. And critically, I'm beginning to think that if you had significant exposure, recurring infections, certainly if you have ongoing symptoms, you should probably check whether or not you have spike protein. Disclaimer here, I am already in contact with the company who seems to know how to measure this. This is relevant. This is important. And um, I suspect my challenge is who needs it? And even if they find it, what do you do about it? That's still a long way to go. And we're still trying to figure out all the answers. But the important thing is that we need to keep our minds open, find solutions, and see if we can make a way forward. Final point, remember, join me. Spike Detox, does everyone need one? I actually think the more that I put this presentation together, the more important this is for us all to consider. Have a great evening.